Did God really say, where are you? What have you done? Why did you laugh? What's that in your hand? Where is your security? What is it you Will you also Why don't you use what you have? Why don't you take a shot? Why don't you take a shot? Why don't you also leave me? Pastor John and our James River campus, our brothers and sisters there, to you who are in presence here at the Buford Road campus, and all of you who are online, thank you for making worship an important part of your day, because God is good, and all the time, and I'm hoping wherever you are, you've already worshipped, and we've certainly worshipped here, so I'd like, like for us to take a chance to thank our praise teams and appreciate them, absolutely, let them know about their it's a beautiful job of helping us worship. It was, it's one of my favorite stories. The, the, it was a Sunday school teacher teaching his five-year-olds in Sunday school class. Uh, he was teaching them about the concept of heaven and how we get into heaven. And so it came time after all of his teaching that he wanted to test them to see whether or not they actually understood this concept of what he'd been uh, delivering to them. And so he began to ask them, so let me ask you children something. He said, if I've sold my house and sold my car and had a, had a big garage sale and sold everything I could and gave all the money to the church... Would that get me into heaven? No, the children said, no. He said, well, uh, what about if I cleaned the church every day and I went out and I kept the yards nice and, and just made sure that God's house was always clean? Would that get me into heaven? No, the children began to shout. He was grinning on the inside because he thought they've really got this. He said, but wait a minute. What if I make sure I love all the animals and that I love my family and that I give, I give every child I know candy when I see them? Would that get me into heaven? No, they screamed. He was so proud. And so he asked them, he said, so how can I get into heaven? Little boy shot his hand up and said, you got to be dead. <laughs> he did pass the test. There is some truth to that. Amen. Uh, in the realm of education, as you know, where there are all kinds of tests, diagnostic tests, proficiency tests, placement tests, and then in all the other realms, psychological testing, emotional testing, uh, physical agility tests, personality tests. Uh, they go on and on, and as has already been said, we have and face tests all the time, but there is this one that means more than any other test, and that is the spiritual tests that we have to deal with. In the Gospel of Matthew, in the third chapter... Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him saying, I need to be baptized by you and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented. And as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, the heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, in wh whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. Then, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Wow, I, I, I don't know if you've... Have you ever experienced a kingdom moment in your life, whatever that might be, or a season of, of just, it was just a kingdom season, and then all of a sudden you wake up and you find yourself in, in a wilderness? I, I mean, when you listen to this story here, Jesus has just been baptized. The, his heavenly Father says, I, I dotes on him from heaven. And the next thing you know, the scripture says, then he was led by the Holy Spirit right into the wilderness. Has that ever happened to you? You experience a, a kingdom moment in life and the next thing you know, you're in the wilderness and you're wondering about Jesus is just beginning his ministry. It's this great moment of celebration in which he is baptized and as we said, God dotes on him. And then apparently God wants to make sure that Jesus is ready. That he begins to clue him in to what's going to be happening over the next three years. It's not going to be easy. As a matter of fact, it's going to be full of opposition. There will be all kinds of struggles that Jesus would have. Now his time and the preparation in this wilderness brings us to yet another of our soul-searching questions that we look at today. Questions that we're looking at posed by either God or by Jesus and sometimes even by Satan. 
Questions that, again, if we're, if we're courageous enough, bold enough to kind of wrestle with and be honest enough to answer, there's a transformational effect that can take place in our lives. Questions that are not asked for the benefit of the one asking, whether it's God, Jesus, or Satan, they're not asking the question to benefit themselves, but it's to benefit us, creating this mode of self-examination in our life. And here's the thing. These questions were asked thousands of years ago, and they're still being asked today. We turn to another one of these, not only today, but actually the next two Sundays. This is a soul-searching question posed by Satan, but it's really not articulated. It's kind of behind the scenes. It's a question that's posed indirectly, if you will. Matthew 4 says, after 40 days, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Talking about Jesus. The tempter came to him, Satan, and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Now the soul-searching question is not articulated in, in that discourse there, this brief, brief moment where Satan is tempting Jesus, but it's behind the scenes, and this is the question that is inferred to Jesus from Satan. Why don't you use what you have to get what you want? Why don't you use what you have to get what you want? Jesus was being tested. It's not new. It even says in Hebrews 5, uh, 8 and 9, Son of God, though He was, He learned obedience from what He suffered. And once perfect, He became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey Him. This idea of testing isn't much fun, but the fact of the matter is we are tested as Christians because it is tantamount to our growing. Because God loves us and wants us to be prepared for what is coming in life, He's got to allow us to be tested to grow us. He's desiring to build the character inside of us, the obedience inside of us that we're going to need in order to be a God follower. We might look at it like this that those tests also are an opportunity for you and for me to unlearn some things and learn some new things. This is not a surprising reality. You don't have to read very far in Scripture before you see tests taking place where God allows those tests. I mean, look at the, the Israelites that wandering in the wilderness. For how long? 40 years? For a trip that should have taken 11 days? And they're wandering for 40 years. Why? Because they're wondering spiritually. Because they were not being obedient in this testing phase. You see, God needed the Israelites who had just come out of 400 years of slavery to unlearn some things. He wanted them to unlearn doing life as slaves. He wanted them to unlearn uh, this idea that just because you're back in power and you're free does not mean that you can just desire worldly things as the Egyptians did. He needed them to learn to be dependent upon Him, upon God to learn what, what blessings flow from being obedient. Abraham was tested. Joseph was tested. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were tested. Job was tested. And Jesus would be tested. And so there's a part of us, we don't need to ask the question, what makes us think we are not going to be tested as well? It is the very thing that will help us grow in our faith. The wilderness, I think, is represented by times when we're no longer distracted by the comforts that we put around us in life, that we're really kind of on cue about this painful thing that may be happening to us, that the wilderness is when we're suffering hardships. Now, those hardships may even come because of decisions someone else has made, and it's affected us. Could be a time of testing in the wilderness. Or the wilderness could become, uh, could happen because of the consequences of our decisions, decisions of disobedience. We're in the wilderness when we are unlearning our self-dependence and learning our dependence upon God. And here's a truth I ran into this week that kind of shook me, that in the wilderness, God, God doesn't test us to see what we're going to do. He knows that. He's testing us so that we will know who we really are. Think about that for a moment. When the tests of the wilderness come to us, God is not allowing those uh, because He already knows how we're going to react, but He's giving us those so we can know who we really are in this relationship with Him. It's for our benefit, not, not for Him. 
It's for our self-examination. It, it's not a time as, I, I don't know about you, but I'm prone to do when I'm being tested. I want to put God under the microscope. What are you doing, God? Hello, can I get, can I get an amen? Anybody? Because testing is not fun. Testing is difficult, but we're being tested so we will learn more, so we can grow in Christ, so that we can, can mature the, the spiritual fruit that He's bestowed upon us. But here's the key. Let us be aware of something. In the middle of our wilderness, Satan will always show up. Always. Because this is perfect opportunity, you see, for him to tear us down. To bring in his best tool, I think, at times, and that's just discouragement. He's there to create doubt and disbelief, to, to work at destroying our faith. You see, Satan gets involved in testing us to make us fail. God tests us to help us rise. Always be aware of that in the middle of the testing in the wilderness. And Jesus is not left out of such a, an experience. Even Jesus is tested. We're told in Scripture Jesus is led to the wilderness. This is where he was to be taken to test, to see how is he going to lead in his ministry? How is he going to lead out uh, to see what kind of Messiah he would be? The kind of Messiah the people wanted him to be or who? God was calling him to be. And so as we enter into this time of testing for Jesus, let, let, let's also not forget this was a spiritual moment for him because he's fasting in the wilderness. He's fasting. He's spending time with God. And he's not eating. So every time he thought about eating, and we know he was, he, he's the son of God, but he's also fully human. And so we're told in Scripture he was hungry. So every time he thought about food, he would use that time to, to, to kind of drill back down in and spending time with God, using any one of those moments that he could. He, it was and is now. It's the very basis of our discipleship. Even the culture we're trying to create at Bonaire Baptist Church, emotionally healthy spirituality. It is totally dependent on us spending time with God. Satan enters the picture. He doesn't just throw a jab at Jesus. He throws a one-two combination. When you look at what he says in this, this, this kind of a, a press to him, if you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. He, the the one-two combination is he's after Jesus to tempt him about self-gratification. And on the other hand, Jesus, how are you going to do your ministry? How, how are you going to perform your ministry? Are you going to do it your way? Or are you going to do it God's way? When we look at this temptation, the tempter comes to him and says, if you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. This was an offer that Satan was making saying, look, use what you have to get what you want. Use what you have to get what you want. You have the power. Use it. You're hungry. Turn the stones into bread. You have the power to feed yourself. So use this. Take care of your hunger. This is about your needs, Jesus. Don't, don't worry about anything else here. I can just hear Satan saying, do you know how good, fresh, hot bread would taste right about now? I bet the, the taste and the smell of it would just be divine. Can't you hear him? You hear this, will you use what you have to get what you want? It's the question behind the scenes being asked. I believe it's a question for us. It's a temptation for us. Will we use what God has given to us to get what we want? How does this work out? Well, so you may know that you're a, a talented singer. So Satan would say, why not use that gift? To, uh, you, you've got to get what you want in life. Use that gift of singing to, to bring adoration, advance your own self, bring recognition. And God said, this is a test. This is a test. Will you use it for my kingdom or yours? Uh, or perhaps you know you have a, a gift in, in uh, finances and in making money. And Satan says, use what you have to get what you want. You know, you want to build that big nest egg. You, you, you want to join the rich and famous. You want to be looked up to and respected in society. And God says, this is a test. You're going to use that for your kingdom or my kingdom? You're so gifted with relationships. Everybody likes you. Why not use it to get what you want? 
adoration, popularity, recognition, influence to wield upon others so that you can benefit yourself. And God said, this is a test. Will you use it for my kingdom or your kingdom? And I don't want us to be naive, any of us in here. We all need to name our gift and we cannot be naive to think that we don't have one because God gifts every one of us with spiritual gifts. And, and Satan is so wily, he's so sly, he will attempt to get us to use the spiritual gifts that God has given us to benefit our kingdom instead of God's. He did it with Jesus. God had granted Jesus divine power and Satan comes in and says, hey, use that power to take care of what you need, what you want right now. You're hungry, aren't you? You hear your stomach growling, Jesus? Use the power. And here God has gifted all of us. He's blessed all of us with spiritual gifts. And Satan is wily enough to try to get us to consider using it for ourselves. To build our own kingdoms. Not the kingdom of God. But our own kingdoms. This question posed behind the scenes by Satan. Why don't you use what you have to get what you want? So if we take that and we pose that in another way, it becomes the title of today's message. What do you really need? What do you really need? Or what, what, do, you really, what do you really want? Is there, is there something you really, really want that you, you, you're thinking, I really need this in order to be satisfied, to be content, to bring, to bring peace in my life? I, I was thinking about this. Think, think about where we are today. Think about where we are today in our life. Do we have more today than we had five years ago? Raise your hand. Do we have more today? Do we have more today than we had 10 years ago? 20 years ago? We have more things today that back then we thought if we could get those things, we'd be happy. Did it work? It doesn't work because it's interesting how many of us long for the good old days when life was simple. There were not the pressures in so many ways. and It was back in the day when we barely had two nickels to rub together and yet we had hope. We had a dream. Had some freedom then that we may not have now after everything we wanted we thought would make us happy so we went and got it. God gives us everything we need to thwart, to put off temptation. Doesn't matter what it is. To overcome the, the selfish temptation of using what we have to get what we want. Because he says, what I want for you is so much better than what you want for yourself. I'm trying to teach you this. And so in the scripture, it shows us one of the ways he, he gives us to fight it off is the very thing that Jesus did. He gives us the word of God. Because we're aware the tempter came to him and he said, if you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. And Jesus answered what? He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Man shall not live on bread alone. Man shall not live on what man humanity thinks they want and need. Stuff. Man can't live on bread alone, material things here. What we need is not found in getting more, if you will, of what we think we need. Hasn't and it never will. The truth is, on every word that comes out of the, word, out of the mouth of God, therein lies what we need to fight off this temptation. Jesus and Jesus alone is our answer. He is that which we need or who we need. He is the answer to every anxiety we face, to every, to every distorted kind of value that we've learned in our society today, to every self-created freedom that we have. He is the answer. He's always been the answer to our guilt, to our sin. But He and He alone is the answer to our wilderness testing. In the first weekend in, in October coming up just a few weeks from now, Dr. Andy Wakefield, who is a professor of Greek and New Testament studies at Campbell Divinity School. He's also a son of Bonaire Baptist. He's going to be here on that weekend to lead us in a retreat. On Friday night, Saturday morning, and Sunday morning, he'll preach on the Gospel of Mark. 
So he's going to come and break open the word of God for us. And so the question becomes, are we hungry enough for the word of God to make a commitment to be here during that event? To figure out what it is I'm going to need in order for preparation for the time of testing that I'm either in or I know will be coming. Because the word of God will always sustain us, always strengthen us, always give us what we need in order to emerge from the wilderness having unlearned some things and having learned some things. God's word is really the only thing that will satisfy us. It'll strip away distortions. It'll expose values of the world that are not godly. It'll lead us into obedience. So I want us to hear this. What I'm saying this morning is God's love does not remove us from being tested. As a matter of fact, we're promised testing. And it's because he loves us that he's going to do it. Because that's how we draw closer to him. Well, that's how we have the opportunity to draw closer to him. The question is, are you in the wilderness today? Do you hear the voice of the tempter saying, in whatever situation you're in, whatever wilderness you are in, do you hear the voice of the tempter saying to you, why don't you use what you've got to get what you want? It could be the wilderness is a time of conflict with others, um, a job predicament, an identity crisis, a financial difficulty, maybe family ties are fractured, maybe you're disappointed in somebody who didn't come through for you, or maybe you're just burdened by guilt of wondering whether or not God really does love you and can love you. That's wilderness testing. We can't turn stones into bread, but we can fall to the temptation. What do you really want? What do you really want? What do you really need? I hear the question, why don't you use what you have to get what you want. Pray with me. Father God, in this very sacred time and space, allow us, Lord, to be honest with ourselves. For we cannot hide from you. When we acknowledge your presence, we become so naked. There's nothing we can hide. And so in these moments, God, it is to answer this question. What has God said to me in this hour of worship? What has God said to me? And how am I going to respond? I pray for the glory of your kingdom, God, that we will answer honestly and faithfully. Amen.